I never dreamed as a child I would become an Olympic champion. Are you prepared to do that again? Rowing is an endurance-based sport. It's pretty ruthless, it's pretty relentless. Are you sure you want to row? When I was living that and doing that, it didn't feel like a huge sacrifice to me. I was just completely all in. In a lot of sports, you can have some superstars, whereas in rowing, as soon as you get into a boat, I think you're all very much leveled out. You've watched, you've got that seven minutes, and you've got to give it to your all. Like, how do you prepare for that? Yeah, it's like when you won, what was going through your head? I had a picture in my mind what it would feel like, and it felt a little bit different than I, I thought it was going to feel. I thought it was just going to be this moment of like, absolute. Quick question, when did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Grace, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. So good to have you here. Thank you for having me. We met at an event which was close to my home for my daughter's school run kids run and i remember my daughter came up to me because you were on stage and you were doing a presentation and she said to me mommy i'd like to speak like this girl one day and i was like you're so right because you're such an amazing presenter but then also learning that you are an olympic champion uh you're a rower and yeah just had to have you on the show so thank you so much for coming no thank you i love the run kids run event as well and it's so nice kind of seeing all the kids out there and, and getting to know them a little bit more so it's it's a very rewarding sort of thing i'm a part of yes and we got to hold your gold medal as well yes, yes. <laughs> many kids that day i was like oh hello a few tried to run off with it did they <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think our kids were probably a bit intimidated by that but um before we get into all of this one of the main questions i have for you is how did you discover that you had a talent for rowing yeah it was it was pretty spontaneous i think um so i'm originally from new zealand and rowing is quite a big sport for us in our high schools but it wasn't ever really on my radar. I was very much into my netball, which is also a huge sport for for people growing up in New Zealand. And I had that in the winter and I was like, oh, I probably need a summer sport to kind of stay relatively fit for netball. And a few of my friends had started the year before and they were like, oh, you're tall, come along and and give it a go. And mm. And once I started, I think I just like took to it straight away. Like I liked the fact that it's a real training sport, like the more you put in, the more you get out of it, um, it kind of rewarded that hard work. And I think that just resonated with me. And gosh, like before I knew it, I was just, it's like 15 years later and I'm still doing it. All my friends stopped after a few years and I just outlasted them all. <laughs> mm. So what was about it that really kind of got you? Um, quite a few things. Like I loved it as a huge team sport. Um, you do all your training together, which I guess has its pros and cons some days or you just want to be by yourself. But um, it's not one of those sports where you train with the team two or three times a week and then you do your other, your own training the rest mm -hmm. of the time. It's two two times a day, sometimes three when you get to the higher level there with the team um and it's it's very demanding physically but having that team element of being like oh all I have to do is turn up and then the team will sort of take care of the rest it's like once you're there of course you're going to work hard of course you're going to commit to it because mm. you wouldn't want to let anyone else down mm. um that was one of the main things that appealed to me and and I think just that 
hard work equals results as well I I got a little bit sick of sports that I could train so hard one week and then have a terrible game whereas rowing I think I saw the correlation between putting in the time and effort and energy and getting results and the better I got the more I could see how that paid off and Mm. and so I think that's why it kind of stuck with me. Mm. So you said you were doing netball as well were you doing any other kind of sport? Um, They were my main ones I think Growing up in New Zealand, we're a pretty sporty country, so mm-hmm. you sort of dabble in it all. And I, I did volleyball a little bit at high school. Um, you, you do kind of do social and or soccer I did for a while. Um, so a, a few other little things. But then as soon as I took up rowing, rowing is quite intense for us at school, um, potentially more intense than it probably should be at that age. Mm-hmm. Um that I mean for a 15 year old you're doing it probably twice a day every day and Mm. and it kind of starts to take over and then so I kind of just phased all my other sports out and and then stuck with the rowing. And remember how old were you at that point? I started when I was about 14. Right yeah Yeah. because I am curious I'm thinking as a parent and looking at you know, how do you figure out what your kids are really good at in sport? And it's interesting that, you know, you've kind of tried and dabbled in lots of different things and then kind of like, this is it, this is the one. And then like literally everything just falls aside and you directly focus on that. Yeah. So do you feel like that's helped you having done different things before you started rowing? Definitely. And I would always advocate for that because I think if you actually do want to do sport long term and seriously, there's so much time for it in your life. And Mm. And when I look look at sort of younger athletes that really want to commit to their one sport quite early on, I I know it's so tempting. And if that's the love of your life, that sport, you you do get tempted into being like, no, I want to commit so early. But Mm. I think that's when you tend to burn out a little bit. And, And I know even when I think about rowing in New Zealand, we have so many kids that do it throughout high school and then stop because they're like, oh, I want a social life. I want to be able to do other sports. I want to be able to do all this. Whereas I'm like, that's the time of your life in high school to do all that. And and you should sort of leave high school and then be like, oh, do I want to get serious about anything else? But um, I think chopping and changing and even physically wise, it's like you're young, you're growing, you don't want to get too um, just sort of set in stone on one sport. It's good Mm. for your body to try different things and make sure you're doing all the movements. Um, So definitely doing a range for as long as possible before committing to one is, I think, the smart option. Was there any other sport that you thought, oh, this is the one before rowing? Probably netball for me, yeah. I think that's the one that I I did a few representative teams for netball as well, and I um, I did a South Island team and and my regional team up until about um, under 21, so I did do that quite seriously as well. But... In the end, it sort of got to my last year of high school and I made my first New Zealand rowing team, the New Zealand junior team, which meant that I was now rowing summer and winter. So it kind of forced my hand and I and I stopped netball there. But that was mm. that was the other one that was on the cards. I <laughs> know, mm. uh, and just, you know, just thinking about like at which point do you decide which is the right one? And it's like, is it like love at first sight kind of thing? Mm. Or is it just trial and error? It is a little bit trial and error. And, and for mm. me, it was almost like what opportunities came up earlier on. Like I think I would have always chosen rowing over netball, but I made a New Zealand team in rowing and my last year of high school. So mm. because of that, I I got to come to Europe for the first time and race. And that sort of was like, wow, this is an amazing sport. Mm. I get opportunities like that. And then you sort of get sucked into the system after that. You start getting, um, you know, access to high performance coaching in that sport and, mm. and opportunities in there. So it sort of paid the way. And of course, you can turn that down and go to another sport. But for me, I was like, gosh, I never thought I'd be a kid that was rowing for New Zealand or competing for New Zealand or anything. I was like, I'm going to take this opportunity and run with it. Talk me through about your parents and how they supported you. Yeah, when I went home and told my parents I wanted to row um, because we didn't have any rowers in my family, but they knew the time commitment. They knew you're you're away every second weekend pretty much. Um, They were a little bit like, are you sure you want to row? Um, are we going to be dropping you off at 5.30 a.m. every morning and doing all this? And I was, I was like, yeah, no, I'm sure. And I think their hearts sunk a little bit. But then um, 
obviously fully supportive because I said I wanted to do it. They just knew it was was not just going to be a commitment for me. It was going to be a commitment for them. Um, But in saying that, once they sort of got into the environment, it's it's almost like a sport for the whole family. You're, you're away a lot of weekends, so they get to, you get to meet the other f- children's parents. And I think actually by the end, they probably loved the sport, if not more than I did, um, and got so much out of competing. And, and it was a really nice feeling that you've got, like you're obviously doing it. And as an athlete, I suppose you have to be a little bit selfish you're you're constantly tired you're missing out on a lot of family holidays you're um, missing out on a lot of events and even when I did get to go home you sometimes you were just like I don't want to do anything this is my only weekend off mm-hmm. um but they were always very supportive of that and and I think knew the pressure I was under and and the stress I was under so were a great help in that but then I think I I enjoyed my parents level of involvement because they were super supportive like logistically when I was younger but then were never parents that sort of um you know put pressure on me to get certain results or were never disappointed if I didn't do well it was just like oh you're sad I'm sad because you're sad Mm. but not I never felt extra pressure from them whereas I saw other people's relationships with their parents and I saw that sort of dynamic which mm-hmm. I was always very thankful that my so parents... it's like emotional and practical support to just yes. enable you yeah to do the things that you already were passionate about yes exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. It sounds like a like sounds like the perfect parent <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean it's I'm looking like I have two small kids and thinking about well how do you support them in terms of when they figure it out and what if they both want to do completely different things and then having to make that commitment for yourself to be able to you know, support your kids. And then one, one thing is the emotional support and the other is like all of the logistics and like how do you, you know, get them to the right places yeah. and talking about even family holidays, potentially having to structure your life around that. Talking about sacrifices or having to make difficult decisions, looking back now, do you feel like there was something that you really wanted to do but you couldn't do it because of rowing and then you had to give that up? It's, I think this has probably been the hardest thing about taking up sport as your career because there are a lot of things you have to sacrifice. Um, I found this really interesting because I've recently retired about a year ago now. This has gone very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's sort of given me the perspective to look back on my life and, and sort of assess how it's gone. And, and I guess because of rowing, it was like that determined where I was going to live like I had to live in a certain place if I wanted to be in the New Zealand team Mm -hmm. um how I was going to study I had to study extramurally because I wasn't near a university and I was traveling a lot um missing friends weddings and 21st and family events and and all of that but I think what I found interesting is when I was living that and doing that it didn't feel like a huge sacrifice to me um Mm -hmm. I think I knew what my goal was and cared about that so much and and knew I wanted to achieve that like more than anything that I was so fine sacrificing that stuff but then as I came to the end of my career and I was sort of tossing up my options do I want to go to Paris or do I want to do another Olympic cycle I think all those sacrifices were weighing on my mind so much and I for me that was a sign that as I think your priorities have changed you're now thinking about what you have to give up and are you willing to give that up and I just didn't feel as willing but at the time I I was like I will miss that I will miss that I I don't mind and it it didn't feel like a burden but yeah it's been a really interesting sort of mindset change and Mm -hmm. I think now looking back on it I realize how different probably my 20s were compared to everyone else and and even you know you, you finish sport and it's now it's time to decide like what career you want to do and and things like that and you said so you've you've probably at I've had amazing experiences and I would not give that up for the world but you know you're going through this big transition which is tough whereas mm-hmm. a lot of other people got to figure that out when they were 20 21 and all of that so mm, I'm not sure everybody gets to figure it out at that <laughs> yeah. age I think some people are still trying to figuring out yeah like 30s 40s 50s yeah. 60s so yeah. I feel like what I'm really fascinated with are people who 
choose something so early on that that becomes the thing that is consistent either throughout their lives or they become extremely proficient and very successful in that one thing. And like, how do you choose that one specific thing that you either feel so passionate about that everything else seems like this is not even anywhere near as good as this one thing that I'm doing. And whether you have any kind of questions or doubt and thinking, oh, maybe I could, instead of rowing, I don't know, I want to be a party planner or (laughs) become an entrepreneur or start this company. Did you have those thoughts then? Or was just like completely just like rowing and like everything pales into insignificance? Uh, I think I was just completely all in. Um, Mm. I I was never really exactly sure what I wanted to do. Mm. I, I think the things I more felt I was missing out on were probably like different social connections and mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff probably weighed more on me than the different career path because I was just so invested in mm-hmm. rowing um, and I just was sort of all consumed by this goal in a healthy way I think like I, I still had balance in my life but I just knew there was nothing more I wanted to achieve mm-hmm. than this and and I think I was also like there was so much time in my life to figure out and do other things but um I was like I don't think I can happily try and chase those dreams until I've achieved this and I think that's why I was so happy that I got the results I wanted in Tokyo because it kind of gave me the um ability to decide and be like you've achieved what you want to do like what do you want to do now you've got the freedom Mm -hmm. it's not making the decision of being like oh you fell short of your goal can you move on from that or or do you have to go again? It sort of was this weight off the shoulder to be like, you can, you can choose whatever you want to choose. Mm. I'd like to go back to the Olympics. When you won, like what was going through your head? It was really interesting, I think, because uh, I don't know, you grow up watching the Olympics and I grew up watching sport a lot and, and you see these athletes sort of have their like absolutely absolute glory moment it's like you know that they've worked so hard for this and and then you see how happy they are so I think I had a picture in my mind what it would feel like and and to be honest I think it felt a little bit different than I I thought it was going to feel and in what way uh I think it was more just I thought it was just going to be this moment of like absolute like elation like out of this world like disbelief and just like <laughs> o- over the top um mm-hmm. sort of emotions running running high and when we I think it was more just this feeling of like such deep satisfaction and and I think it was because of the build up as well because it was about a year where we weren't even sure it was going to happen because of covid and the delay and and all of that so it sort of put it in perspective that I mean, it's a privilege to even race. So I think there was just that moment of being like, thank God we got the opportunity to be here and try and achieve our dream. And and we did. And and I think I had had such a long journey in my boat with Kerry, my peer partner. We'd rode together for about six years and we'd been through so much together. And we got to a point where we really knew we could achieve mm-hmm. winning gold. And And I think because of that, we like when it happened I was like wow we've put so much time and effort into this and we've got it it was just like this moment of like such satisfaction whereas I think if I didn't believe I could have truly done it and then won it it would have been that almost like disbelief but Mm. on on the other hand I think the emotion that I found super interesting was I was like a little bit not sad but I was like wow it's over like I was like it was such a, an amazing journey and so much went into it and I had such a good time obviously really hard times as well mm-hmm. but when we won I remember us being like wow we finally achieved it but like it's over like mm-hmm. it, it was almost like this slightly like a bittersweet of like we just loved it so much how long did that moment last in terms of feeling satisfied um, it was it was quite an interesting sort of like aftermath of the Olympics for us because I think it was quite a unique situation that because of COVID, you had to leave the village straight away. So mm-hmm. about 48 hours after our race, we were already on a plane back into New Zealand and New Zealand was still in lockdown. So then we were literally all put in hotel rooms by ourselves for two weeks straight. Mm. So I think that sort of changed. Like I was, it had its pros and cons, I think, because a lot of, athletes talk about this sort of like gold medal high and then 
sort of that fall afterwards and and the sort of like gold medal depression or whatever it's called and sort of coming back to reality after being on such a high and I think going straight back into an environment like that which was relatively underwhelming Mm. and quite isolating because you're literally in a hotel room by yourself it sort of evened out the emotions I felt and and I kind of liked it because it sort of made my results and my medal kind of just for myself like I didn't have you know, you weren't being paraded around and told, oh, my God, you're amazing, these results doing these interviews. And, mm. of course, you're still doing a little bit, but not to the same extent. So you weren't getting all this public sort of acknowledgement, which meant it was just me sort of reflecting on my mm. own journey and being like, wow, you've ended up a gold medalist. Who who would have thought? Not you. Um, so it was sort of like a, um, a leveller, which... I guess it's pros and cons that like you missed out on all that mm. excitement from sharing it with other people. But for me, I think it was actually quite nice because I, I'm probably not someone that's too phased about getting sort of the public acknowledgement, but it was just, I was able to sort of, you know, make it special for me, my friends, my family. Mm. Kind um, of process and reflect on it for yourself. Yeah. 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 Mm. But yeah, it was it was a weird environment. <laughs> so how long was it? How, like because I'm just curious, because we all have these goals that we're striving towards that we, you know, once I reach there, then I'm gonna be happy. And then you imagine this happiness to be this like all consuming, amazing feeling that will just gonna last forever. So I'm just curious how long exactly <laughs> you feel like that. Is it a, is it a, an hour? Is it a day? Is it a week? Is it a month? Like yeah. how long? I, I honestly I think it still feels a bit surreal. So mm. I, I that's something I almost struggle with a little bit as well. Mm. Um it, it's obviously such a whirlwind straight after you are mm. you are racing and then you're getting your medal which is just like a, a bit of a blur as well and then you're doing interviews and and then it's just sort of you're back in real life and people are like wow that's amazing and and I, I think the whole time I was just I still feel a little bit like uncomfortable saying what I've done because people will be like if I say I'm like in a career transition at the moment they'll be like well what did you do and I'll be like oh well I guess technically I was like a professional mm-hmm. athlete but it feels like it's a little bit of that like imposter syndrome you sort of put the people that cheat what well, I did put people achieve these sort of things on a pedestal and I'm like well te- technically I'm one of those as now so I think it it doesn't wear off but it still feels a little bit surreal when people talk about it and I'm mm. like oh yeah I do, I do have an Olympic gold medal I was like, it feels so strange yeah <laughs> it's like how you feel about yourself and then also you know what what is actually happening in you internally and then getting the external validation because I feel like those two things play a part because the external evidence that you have done well is also important I mean if we just focus on that that's not healthy but i talking about how we missed out on some of that elation of, of, of celebration of other people saying that that's amazing it's almost like when you get married and you build up to this wedding and then like that's it that's why you then need to go on like a honeymoon and then you have to have all these other things planned to maintain that sense of sort of celebration and do things for yourself yeah, yeah. Mm. and I definitely agree with having stuff planned for afterwards and and for me I was fortunate that I had I'd planned to come over to the UK and study at Cambridge University and so Mm. I probably had from the Olympics ending to coming over here maybe like a month or two to sort of enjoy some downtime but I knew something was coming up for me and I knew Mm. that I was like this is a completely different environment it's going to be new exciting and then I got here and it was so busy that I didn't really have the time to be like oh how has your life changed like what's different um how are you feeling are you making the right choices it was sort of just like sucked me into a new goal and a new Mm. environment which I think was really important for me otherwise you can be like wow I've literally spent the last 10 years focusing so much on one thing and regardless I was I was happy with how it went but whether you achieved it or not it's still a weird feeling to be like it's over. What what are you going to consume your life that you've like every day for however many years you've mm. been working towards this and now now it's gone. It's such a weird feeling. Mm. I'd love to talk about career transitions, but I'm going to save that towards the <laughs> end because I'd still want to focus on the training part. The winning is what we all kind of gearing ourselves towards. But talk me through the preparation and the training and 
having to do the difficult things. Yeah, it's it's such rowing, I think particularly is such an interesting sport because in in the time frame I would say maybe 96% of our time is spent training, 4% is racing. So I think everyone else only sees the racing, the good parts, the like more enjoyable parts, but it's it's a pretty tough training sport. Um I quite liked that, but it, it was hard and and I think I was very fortunate to come into a team that we had a few successful athletes already. So I, I sort of came in as a very young athlete and I was then able to see, you know, you sort of look at successful people and I'm like, oh, it comes easy to you. You're like, I go and watch you race, you win. It looks easy, it looks effortless. But then when I came into the team and saw what they did every single day, I was like, wow, the amount of work that they put in, that's why they were successful. So it kind of set my standard of what was required if I did want to be a world champion. Um, this is what I'm going to have to do. Yeah, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Am I, yeah. am I prepared for this? Um, I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> not really sure. But um, it was, it's pretty ruthless. It's pretty relentless. Um, but for me, I, I sort of resonate more with a sport like that mm. than one that you have to turn up and just put out a good performance on the day. It's like I'm I'm a trainer. Like I, I quite like being out there for a few like mm. hours on end and, and not everyone does. But, it, it, yeah, it was good for me. <laughs> so what was so hard what were the hardest parts it's rowing is an endurance based sport like it, I guess in the end the races aren't that long they're about seven minutes depending on your boat class um but time-wise training it's like every morning you're probably doing a two and a half sort of two and a half ish hour row it can be about 30k and then you might come in for an hour and then you might hop on the rowing machine and do that for maybe about 90 minutes um, and then come in for a few hours and then go back and do some weights. Um, but it's just a volume-based sport. So it, it's it's pretty relentless. And so how many hours a day are you training? Um, well, probably physically training a day would probably be maybe six. But then obviously you've got your... Um, everything around that you've got your physio you've got your work on you've got your stretching you've got your core so it's it's like a it's a lot kind of on top of that you've got your meetings with nutritionist psychologist um all of that so I mean it's pretty time consuming and it's just it's a very monotonous sport as well it's it's not ex- it's not exciting like I liked it but I, mm. I would imagine not many people would find it exciting I, I don't know I mean I, I, I disagree that doing th- for example like jogging or running or being on a bike there is something about when you are in a certain rhythm that yes. your brain just really likes it like the run is high when you're yeah. doing something that has a certain pace and the rhythm and it puts you almost in this sort of meditative state mm. that can feel extremely like it, you're in flow. Yes, and, and that's what we'd call it. It's like you want to get in the state of flow where mm. you can be like, wow, I just like 10 Ks went past and I, I didn't even notice. And then you're like, I could do this for, forever. And, and I think I was very fortunate I was able to find a combination with Kerry that we did get into that quite often. So mm-hmm. it made it very sustainable. And I think that's why we could row together for so long because we clicked in training and and I sort of looked at those crews that would kind of battle away and train and be like, well, it must be very tough for you. But mm. we could get on the water every day and mm. know that it was going to feel good because yeah. we got to that level. I'd love to talk about the team aspect of it, but first I want to focus on your own mental preparation about what you do to get ready for a competition. So knowing that you're going to be, you know, you're watched, you've got that seven minutes and you've got to give it your all like how do you prepare for that yeah it's quite tough and and I I sort of had to learn that as I as I went on I I remember when I was a younger athlete I would get really nervous and I'd do all this training all year and then I'd turn up at world champs and I'd be sitting there being like oh my god can I would pay someone to get me out of the situation right now like it's these nerves are horrible I feel not nice I I don't like this and And after a while, I was like, God, are you doing all this training? And then you're getting to the moment that you should be so excited for. Nervous, yes, but excited as well and feeling horrible. Like what's what's happening? Like you need to go and sort of assess why you're feeling like this. And I think it was a it was a good learning for me that you're always going to feel nervous. But there's a difference between sort of learning how to manage that in a positive way 
or letting the nerves sort of get the best of you. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of um, work around sort of understanding how the brain works and um, what happens and, and even how my specific brain works to cause me to think certain ways. And, and that was really, that was quite a game changer for me because I think I'd done a lot with psychologists and sports psychologists before, but I just found it all a little bit, um, I think it didn't resonate with me enough, but when I started to learn the science behind it, that's when it sort of clicked with me. And, and, you know, if I was sitting there being like, I feel so nervous, I'd be like, oh, it's because your brain is sending you these emotions and like your brain's primed to protect you. And they know, it knows you're about to go out there and put yourself in pain. So it's just making you aware of that. And, and, and then I was like, okay, so that's all right. I I know I've done this before. I know I can do it again and, Mm -hmm. and learning how to manage those emotions, but it takes a lot of effort and you, you can't really get to a world champs and fix it on the day. So it's, it's about putting the time and energy in prior to getting to your pinnacle event. So we were talking about the physical preparation, yeah. talking about two hours in the morning break, you know, 90 minutes, like, you know, six hours of like physical training and then all the other things in between. So talk me through what does the day look like in terms of the mental preparation? Um, it, it sort of ranges probably depending on the day and whether you're racing or competing, but it, it can, it sort of, you kind of create your own routines. And, and I know for Kerry and I, we, we did a lot of work with um, this lady called Natalie who helped us to learn all about our brains and things. And we went through and made a sort of a daily routine for our mental well-being to make sure we were always in the best state possible. And there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of things you can't control. So it's important to have those things. And that's even like little things about like what, what you do when you first wake up. It's like how you approach the day right then. And So and, what would you do when you first wake up? Um, well, so because we went through the stage of being like, she, she asked us the same thing. And I was like, oh, my God, I fly out of bed. I get up. I, I'm like already stressed. I'm like, down my coffee, have my breakfast. It's like you're primed and ready to go. And she was like, you guys live in such a – stressful state anyway she's like these little routines are when you can actually make like calm your nervous system and and make yourself more relaxed and able to like start the day in a more uh, meditative way so it's like when you get out of bed actually just sit there for a second and be like you know stretch and 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 it takes 10 seconds Mm -hmm. and then she's like even you know when you go and make your coffee actually like sit there and actually really enjoy it like it's not you rushing to see how fast you can do it it's like sit there take the moment enjoy the, and like when you walk outside because when we were saying we we're like oh sometimes we just you know the idea of going to training we're so tired it's it's horrible she was like go outside and be like actually it's a privilege you know I get to go to training this is my job like I get to go out there and exercise for my job and you know, walk outside and be like, oh, it's such a nice day. And and it, it kind of sounds all these cheesy things, but it sort of flips your mindset mm. from being like, this is a chore, I have to go to rowing, it's like this. But when you sort of have a positive spin on it, it can just, it can really help. And mm. another thing we sort of tried to work on as well is really celebrating any sort of little things we did well. And, and on the water, you can sort of fall into a trap of always being like we need to be better we need to be better which is mentally very draining Mm -hmm. constantly feeling like you're trying to make improvements so we sort of got into a habit of you know after we did a good piece or a good role or something she was like just spend like 10 seconds sitting there being like enjoying that moment before you're before you sort of move on to be like well, what can we do better? Because otherwise it just feels like a never ending cycle. <laughs> we also never really get the chance to feel that satisfaction. So you're kind of saving it all up for that big moment in the future, as opposed to being like, okay, this is the reward for myself. This is what I've been working towards. Let's sort of reflect on, I mean, it's mindfulness. Yes. It's about being mindful of what happens to you and paying attention to the cues in your body. Yeah. Um, So we were talking about this earlier about how, you know, when you're an athlete, you get so much support, so much coaching, whereas regular people it's almost like when something is broken then you maybe go to therapy or when you become a CEO and for the first time you get a coach uh, that you haven't had before and that you know support of experts and coaches is really what gets you well to help you to 
figure out the stuff that you don't know, but also to get you to that peak performance. Uh, that's so, yeah, that's so precious and so important. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think I always looked at my situation compared to my brother and sisters who were both in different professions. Um, and and I was always like, wow, I'm given so much help. And, and I think it's something I always struggled with in sport because there's a lot of dialogue around the pressure young athletes are around. And mm-hmm. I do think there's a lot of pressure on them and sort of, um, you know, the culture and the environment and how tough it is and we need to help them more, which I definitely agree. I think there's circumstances that that needs to happen but then I'm also on the other hand sitting there and being like we're actually also very privileged like we we as athletes need to take a little bit of self-responsibility and accountability to to realize what resources we are given Mm -hmm. because you know my brother and sister didn't have um, access to a psychologist from the age of you know 17 that they could just go to for free or and and go and get help like that or they didn't have people sitting there being like oh are you sore are you tired are you thirsty are you any of this like there's so many people out there trying to help us and Mm. and I yeah I look at sort of the world and the environment and how much pressure everyone's under that I think yes sport's tough but we're also in a great position as well so Mm. it's kind of realizing and taking responsibility to access those resources so that you do train yourself to mm. cope with the tough environment. You said that you've l- realized certain things about how your own brain works. What did you learn about yourself through this? Uh, I think my main one was I I spent a lot of time learning, and it's probably from my dynamic and my, my boat with um, Kerry, we dealt with stress in very different ways and and I was always naturally like we always thought of it as like a ladder and it's like if we're both sitting in the middle of the ladder and stress comes on I like climb the ladder climb down the ladder and I sort of will shut off like I will internalize I will not really give a lot back um whereas she probably like climbs up the ladder and it was like you know every emotion she wants to talk about or like it's like fiery or or any like anything like that and and we were both like, wow, we really do need to meet in the middle. Like mm-hmm. neither is a overly good. It's like the anxious and the avoidant. Yeah. The same <laughs> <laughs> it really, Trying to really row in the same direction. Yeah. Mm, and like I, a metaphor for life. <laughs> I know, literally. And I was like, oh my gosh. I, and every time this happened, I would be like, every time I would go down the ladder, I would, I, I knew in my mind, I was like, this must be so annoying for you having to deal with someone that's just not really willing to give you a lot back or just be like, I don't want to talk about or just sort of shut down. And, and I was like, that's such an annoying thing. And I I think also just understanding that that is just how my brain is wired and and neither of us right or wrong. But it's such an important thing to be able to understand first of all, how you think and feel and also how other people think and feel because it gives you a lot more sympathy towards people. You know, mm-hmm. you sit there being like, you, why are you reacting like that? Whereas they, they're also thinking the same about you. Um, so having that sort of understanding was really important. And I think also for me, it just built my confidence, sort of learning more about how my brain worked. And even as I got to more of like a senior athlete within the team I never really saw myself as someone that would be a leader or anything I'm probably more slightly more introverted um you know I'm probably not gonna stand up there if I if I don't need to um but it was learning like oh this this is how I think this is how I feel and and maybe I can create a pathway towards leadership in another environment and you know use my personality skills to to do that rather than thinking I have to fit a certain mold so it was all Mm. that sort of understanding and self-awareness that really helped me I think sort of grow as an athlete and a person what I love you saying like oh I'm an introvert and yet the first thing I said to you is because my daughter (laughs) said oh I want to be like her on stage speaking like she does (laughs) and how much being an introvert doesn't mean that you can't go out and do these things and be you know outspoken and be sociable and it's a different way of perceiving the world but talk me through that dynamic in terms of being part of a team and what you've learned yeah it's, it's a really interesting dynamic because I think in a lot of sports and I'm probably not giving them enough credit that you can have some superstars and those superstars can carry the team you can 
you know, and, and, and football, someone can do something amazing. And obviously the better the team is as a whole, the better you're going to go, but individual performances within a team can count. Whereas in rowing, as soon as you get into a boat, I think you're all very much leveled out. And, and regardless of whether you're better or you're worse, you, you have an overall team performance. And, and once you're in the boat, the the feeling is very much a crew feeling like you can't be feeling good if someone else is feeling bad because it just has such an impact on what the boat feels like so you it's very much the definition of like you're only as strong as your weakest link so I think that's why it's such an advertisement for like teamwork because you've got to manage that dynamic and and it's also understanding that everyone's different Mm -hmm. and everyone has different strengths and so I also wrote a lot in an eight which I think that's probably more of an environment where you've really got to understand that. Mm. And and I think sometimes we did that well and sometimes we didn't. Like I, I went to two at Olympic Games and um, the first one was Rio and I was in the eight and we came fourth. And I think we were a bit younger and didn't really embrace everyone's individualities as well. Whereas we sort of learnt from Rio and then leading into Tokyo, we understood that what everyone else is good at I might not be as good at and and you sort of um balance each other out and I I remember someone saying to me one day it was like well do you think if there was eight graces in the boat would you do well and I was like oh god no I need so and so to be able to do that because they're so good at that and I need this girl because she's so good at that I was like I need all her strengths and I think that was a real eye-opener to me to be like yes other people have weaknesses but their strengths are so important to sort of bring out the best in each other. Mm. So it, it can be frustrating when people don't think the same or do things the same. But in the end, I think that's almost what makes teams very successful when you have a little bit of um, productive conflict to bring out the best of each other. Talk me through that because I am a huge believer in that. Yeah. This kind of Creative tension is what I call it. What did you call it? Productive conflict. Productive <laughs> conflict. What does productive conflict look like? Uh, to me, I would I would say it's it's you can have conflict, but when you're both going towards the same goal and you both know what the bigger picture is, it can often be productive. So, you know, you don't want people sitting there just being agreeable or doing what other people do because they're just going to follow, I think, the ability to like call one another out to, and and obviously when you're in quite stressful environments it can be quite heated um but if everyone has sort of sat down initially at the start of the season at the start of a year where whatever sort of environment you're in and agreed on what they're working towards you can always sort of bring it back to the main goal and that's when you know, for us, it was always like the boat's bigger than the person. So the boat has to come before everyone else. And when we were having disagreements, it would, it was always for the best of the boat. So, you know, I, I didn't have issues raising any grievances because I was like, I wouldn't sit on this knowledge because I want us to improve. Um, whereas if I sat here and and sort of just internalized it, I think I would, be disappointed in myself because I was like well if that could make us improve why wouldn't I say that and if someone else didn't like what I was saying I think maybe initially you get annoyed but then they would be like oh we we all agree we're trying to make the boat the best we can make it so if someone's saying something it's because they think that so Mm. it's it's sort of being able to have those tough conversations and uncomfortable moments because it's not yeah, being yeah. afraid to speak up because then it's for the common good yes. as opposed to being something that you're just annoyed with for yourself. Yeah. I mean, there's huge analogies between successful businesses that have that common purpose that everybody's working towards and what is coined, you know, psychological safety, where you can raise concerns that you're not afraid that your boss is going to talk you down or your colleagues are going to think that you're stupid, that you can say whatever is on your mind because it is for the common good versus the environments where the superstars, potentially toxic superstars that are an a-hole in (laughs) the rest of the environment, but they perform Mm. and yet they're being rewarded makes the rest of the team feel like they are like what are they there for like th- their contribution doesn't count yeah was there a time when somebody wasn't speaking up or the tension wasn't able to be diffused 
And what was the impact of that on the performance of the team? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think when you ask that example, my the thing that pops into my head first is the difference between my two Olympic campaigns. So sort of mentioned before, I went to the Rio Olympics as well. And I, I think we were, uh, the crew I was in then was less comfortable bringing up things. And and it's funny because you we're all very intelligent human beings. We know when we're sort of lying to ourselves or lying to each other and and there was a stage leading into the Olympics that we would sort of get off the water and it wouldn't have been a good row, but mm-hmm. we would all sort of have this fake positivity and be like, no, it was good. And and no one was willing to be the one that stuck their hand up and said, that wasn't good. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean we're not going to do well at the Olympics, me saying this, but if we want to get better, we, we need to address X, Y, Z because it's not going well. And and we got to this stage where then we were like, oh, it's it's too close to the Olympics. We can't bring up any sort of concerns now. So we very much like swept everything under the rug. And it's it's that's never a good good thing to do. And and then we got to our pinnacle event. And obviously, if you've been doing that for long enough, when the real pressure comes on, it's like those sort of cracks in the foundation are gonna show. And and that definitely happened to us. And I think instead of banding together at the Olympics we probably all sort of like went in our different directions and probably formed little groups to talk about issues and and things like that rather than having those sort of open and honest conversations and Mm -hmm. then we ended up coming forth which very much getting a medal was a was our goal so after having that real like real experience I think we had quite a good honest debrief and and you know we were all very much like if if we're going to put four years of work into getting to another Olympics we don't want the same thing to happen so Mm. kind of sat down and and talked about like how are we going to make it an environment where you can raise concerns and you can bring up awkward things and the way we did that was was sort of to identify that you need a common goal and then you need your common values that sort of gives you permission to bring up these things because if you have all agreed that this is your value and someone's doing something that goes against it it's actually a really easy way to bring up to be like oh remember when we sat down and we all thought that was our value what you're doing right now isn't really aligned to that and you and you're like oh yes I did agree to that so I can't really argue that and Mm -hmm. I think having those sort of roles and um also just making it normal Mm-hmm. It, it, it's hard at the start but then after, after a while it just becomes the normal thing and and then it it's just integrated into your daily life but I think we almost lived and breathed that going into Tokyo which meant that when we got to Tokyo we'd you know we talked about everything that annoyed us we talked about everything that we thought wasn't going well we've talked about everything that we could possibly do that there were no surprises going to be thrown at us and we'd sort of worked through everything difficult that I was like, God, if something tough happens now, if something unexpected happens now, I know about to cope with that because of that time we coped with that and that time we coped with that. We would have so much pressure doing it mm-hmm. that it was like almost the complete opposite to the Rio situation. Mm-hmm. Like a post-mortem, like you yeah. go over and you go through all of the things that could have worked better or mm. what worked well or what the issues are. Was there somebody who instigated this or... Did you have some sort of a, a process to go? Or how did it come about, how, you know, really forcing, forcing, really making sure that you have this conversations? Uh, I think it was largely driven by the athletes, actually, because it's you're sitting there and you you remember the feelings and the emotions when you didn't achieve what you wanted to achieve. So we're all pretty motivated people and we definitely had help from the organization and the coaches as well but Mm. in saying that if the people that have to actually do the work don't buy into it it's never going to be a successful um Mm -hmm. so like we were very much in control of sitting down and working out our own vision our own values and all of that but in the review process I think it's always very useful to have someone from the outside so like I know rowing New Zealand we did quite an official review with them Mm -hmm. um with our coaches like we got we got a new coach and he was very good at sort of debriefing that and being like well what are we going to do so there was a little bit some bits and pieces from different people but yeah I think you've got to buy into it the people on the ground need to buy into it having a common common values and common goal 
And then individual accountability. Yes. And that everybody's responsible for speaking up talking about sort of next stages for you and going through this career transition talk me through that how do you feel now yeah it's it's a it's an interesting stage mm. i think it has its pros and cons and and one of the reasons i wanted to retire and go on to this next stage is because i wanted to go through this and feel these emotions and start figuring it out i i think some days i'm like it's so exciting and then some days i think i sit there being like you've probably uniquely found something that you were so good at. Will you ever find something else that you're that good at? And I was like, well, actually, probably realistically, maybe not. Like, you got to the top, top. Mm. Um, but I think getting over How does that the, make you feel? It, it's it's uncomfortable. It's a, a, in two minds to be, first of all, to be like, you've been very fortunate to get to that level mm. of something. Like, not many people get to do that in this world. It's like you literally got to the top of the world. Um, so I think that feels like very special but then equally it's like how do you fill that void Mm -hmm. and find something that maybe isn't going to give you those same high and highs but maybe they won't give you the same lows um so I think it's getting your head around how to embrace that as something exciting rather than daunting Mm -hmm. um but it's yeah as I say like it's some days I'm like so on top of it and other days I'm like oh what am I doing (laughs) you mentioned some of the low lows tell me about that I think it's just the pressure that comes along with sport um that there is always moments of not getting selected which when you put so much effort into something and then something like that happens it's it's very hard um I think for me, my lows were probably not related too much to actual results and things. It was more how I was coping with what was going on and training at the time and 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 sort of the ability to be on top of like my mental health and my mental well-being and and all of that sort of stuff. Um it, it's an environment that it's it's super intense, so it can wear you down. I think as a person I I, I coped quite well in it um but it is tough um I I think one of my probably best traits or skills that that I have that allowed me to cope all right in it is my ability to almost not think too deeply into things that I can't control um like I I don't think I have a natural instinct to overthink things which Mm. um has, has served me well in rowing but yeah I think sport's full of highs and lows and and even looking back on them now it's that I think they seem less like lows because if I was asked sort of why were you successful in Tokyo I would have said oh it's because of that time when I when I lost that race and because that time when I wasn't selected for that crew so I think at the time it seems like the world's ending Mm -hmm. but then I think I needed to go through that to be successful. So I think you have more perspective now on the lows. Mm. But obviously it's not nice at the time. (laughs) No, it's very humbling when you're kind of faced with that. And I think just the sheer fact of feeling, feeling the feelings and then being able to overcome and say, you know what, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to go again. And just that effort of maybe not even giving up, but just persevering and you know, stepping above your limitations or your your fears and your your challenges. And that gives you confidence as a stepping stone because the more times you are able to overcome those moments, then it gives you the confidence that you can do them again. Yes. And but they are hard, like when when you're faced with that. <laughs> yeah. Actually on the on the on the topic of quitting, I mean that's an interesting one for me because there's all this idea of, well, perseverance and like, don't stop, you know, this, you know, and to get to the top of your game, it's kind of what's required. Yeah. What's your view on quitting? It's it's an interesting one because I think there's a lot of different things that probably go into it. Mm-hmm. Um I think that's when I would almost come back to you having to know and be self-aware of what you need as a person, what you, like how we kind of touched on, like how your brain works and all that thing, all that, all that type of things. Because 
I think there's times in people's lives where maybe what they're doing isn't right for them. It's not bringing them happiness. It's not making them a good person and maybe stepping away is the right thing. Mm. But it's a different, that is different than being, this is hard. This is going to take a lot of effort. It's going to be difficult. But actually it is what I want to do and I can work through it. So that's when you need to understand like what emotions are making you feel like you want to quit. Like in sport, anytime I, I wanted to stop, it was because I was exhausted and I was tired and I was sore and it just I didn't want to be there that very second. But I, I knew working through that was going to get me to a goal that I actually really wanted to, to do. But I've definitely seen people in sport as well, but also in the real world, uh, real world, <laughs> wasn't in the real world, um, that I was like, I don't think this environment is the best for you. Maybe it's time for you to step away but it's having that knowledge of like what you need as a person. So talking about retirement, is this something that you have chosen or how does it work? Like when do you as an athlete retire? Um, I, I feel very fortunate how I've retired. I, I, for a lot of athletes, it's not often their own choice to step away, but um, it's because of performances or not getting selected anymore or any of that. So that sort of like forces you out of the sport, but I guess for me, I was still doing really well. Like I, after the Olympics, I did one more world champs and, and we won gold. So I think I was like, if I wanted to continue on to Paris, I've had the perfect start. Um, performance wise, I was still doing well. I was still loving the sport, but I think we sort of touched on it before. I think everything going really well really gave me the power to sort of assess whether it was still right for me and we've talked about sort of what you've got to sacrifice to live the life of an athlete and for me my mindset kind of changed a little bit after Tokyo and and I never dreamed as a child I would become an Olympic champion and I I was like wow you've achieved this like is trying to do that again what you want to do more than anything or do you want to go off and explore other things because rowing is not a sport that you can sort of be one foot in, one foot out. And and I think about all the time and training and everything I put into the Tokyo Olympics. And and I was like, are you prepared to do that again? Because mm. if if you want to go to Paris, that's what you're going to have to do. And, and for me, I started thinking about, oh, but I sort of maybe want to do this or want to do this. And it was t- quite a tough decision to make because I was like, I still love the sport. I'm still going really well. And it's the Olympics, like what an opportunity. Mm. But I, I think I, I didn't want to be an athlete that sort of had to draw it out long enough that I left hating the sport. And and I still miss it, but I don't I don't miss it in a way that I wish I was still doing it. I just miss it because I loved it. And mm. I think that's quite a nice feeling. Obviously it goes through waves as well, but mm. it was nice that I feel like I had the power to make that decision. So what now for you what's next yeah it's it's been quite a journey I can't believe it's already been a year it's kind of terrifying but I I, at the moment I'm sort of exploring what's next for me and and I've been doing a lot of almost like leadership development consulting which I'm really enjoying because I feel like I learned so much through sport and we sort of touched on the fact that I've had a lot of help to learn this stuff and then also just through actually being in different environments and situations I've taught and learnt the skills as well and I think those skills are so beneficial in in the business world as well so at the moment I'm sort of working on saying how you can transfer what I've learned in a sporting environment to be really beneficial in any sort of team no matter what your goal no matter what industry you're in or what you're doing because I think there's a lot to learn from sports so Mm. I've just been enjoying sort of going into different businesses and and trying to help them with that. And and it's also been really nice because it's given me a chance to reflect on my journey, which is really hard to do when you're living and breathing it. Whereas now I've stepped away, I can sit and be like, what did you actually learn? And yeah. what did you take away from it? And what why were you successful? Which has been a really quite a nice process mm. to go through. You said something earlier about you know, you found something that you were so passionate and all in for so early and feeling very fortunate about that. Do you feel compelled that you you have to find that again? I I hope I hope to. I I don't know if it's a realistic. I like I've I've lived and breathed one sort of environment and and I think sport is the 
like height of that intensity of having like such a clear goal mm. I I don't know if it's realistic to have such a clear goal in any in, in other industries that like you might want to get to a certain level in a from on a, in an organization or achieve this within a business but it's still sport is very black and white you can mm. work towards times you can work towards medals you can work towards any of that um so I think it would be nice but I I, I think it's a, it would be a process I have to work through and mm. and sort of try to fill that void whether it's as clear or as exciting maybe not but yeah I think that's the challenge that a lot of athletes have Mm. after leaving their sport. Well we're talking about earlier about having experienced different types of activities in different sports and then you kind of land on one. I almost feel like whenever there is that moment of change then it's a little bit of experimentation. It's about trying things because you don't know what you don't know. Yes. So, and I think one of the things I'd like for like the corporate world to change is this idea of, well, you have to have had, you know, experience in not one particular sector or one particular role. There is a benefit of reflecting what you've done and making that pivot because then you are making those decisions consciously and there's so many skills that are so transferable and then if you feel so passionate about it plus marrying up your like enthusiasm and and qualities and skills and experiences to make another success somewhere but um but yeah as i said some people don't (laughs) find that passion at all sometimes in their lives and sort of in the fleeting between that so no i think it's a really interesting period of time for you going back now looking at your your younger self and you know your that maybe maybe that 13 year old just before maybe you discovered rowing what advice would you give yourself? I I would tell a younger Grace, I think, to be more confident in her approach to things. I believe I, I, I for a long time, I, I think I tried to mimic the way other people approach things, the way other people had their personalities, or even not even mimic, but almost be jealous of people that could thrive in certain situations or, or things like that. But I think as I as I grew up, I learned that actually you can have your own approach, and and it it, it means you may do things differently, but it's it's got a lot of benefit for you out of that and that and and that took me a long time to come, and I think that's like learning to be confident in yourself, and and I think as probably at thirteen was probably the peak of my like level of unconfidentness, um, and it, it's something that. I think you naturally get more confident as you grow older, but at that age, I think if I was more accepting of myself and my abilities, it would have been a nicer period of my life. Whereas, yeah, learning that later on is all all well and good. But it was interesting. I think I, I got to see a few different role models along the way that I was like, oh, you do things so differently. And, oh, you're not what I would consider a stereotypical, um, leader or stereotypical like successful athlete but you've made it because you've figured out your approach and and I was fortunate to have that Mm -hmm. shown to me in life but I I don't know if everyone would um but yeah I think it's it's learning that there's sort of not one pathway forward and you know don't think you can't become an Olympic champion because you're not ticking this box this box this box if that's really what you want to do find your own route and and sort of go 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 that way well I think it's you're not a you're not a finished product I don't think you ever are no so you're talking about having more confidence wouldn't we all love to have that just to feel so certain and so you know yes I can do everything but I feel like sometimes feeling like that and then overcoming it is I mean it's what gives you confidence to go forward it's just you know sometimes like I just wish it was a little bit earlier yeah and then I could have been even like you know more successful yeah um any particular books that made the most impact on you um I've read a few interesting ones I actually read one recently that it's, it's actually a very rowing based book um but it's called will it make the boat go faster and I think that was um important for me because it sort of as an environment that I understood 
that sort of drew out a lot of the lessons that are rel- like that relate to the real world and the business world as mm-hmm. well. So it was nice to kind of see, oh, you've had because that was at a time where I was potentially feeling a little bit unconfident with my work experience because I haven't had work experience as such, but I've had a different sort of experience. And and reading this book, I was like, oh, you've learned, you have learned so much. Like everything, I was like, oh yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, and that's actually so important. And mm. I think it's quite useful for businesses and things to read. Mm. And I'm going to put it on my reading list. Yeah, I'm asking because it's like I'm looking for new books for uh, September. So. Ah, yes, yeah. Well, Grace, thank you so much. It's been like so fascinating hearing you, and I feel like. It's almost been like a coaching conversation for me in terms of just taking the lessons that you have learned and applying them to my own life. I mean, some things that I talk about, but just, you know, framing it this way and the, you know, having to deal with pressure, having to deal with working in a team, having to have the same goal, being able to have the same vision going in the same direction. I think we all will benefit from from your lessons. And I wish you all the best in New York space. I have absolutely no doubt that whatever you're going to do is going to be amazing. And uh, thank you so much. No, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.